On today's show, we will go around the conference as an Aggie defender declares for the draft, a Vol Duke DB opts out of their bowl game, and much more. Lynn Scarborough of Lindy Sports is going to join us to give his thoughts on the Iron Bowl collapse for Auburn, and he'll give us his pick for the SEC championship game between Alabama and Georgia. And the latest bowl projections are out for the 13 SEC teams that are bowl eligible. We'll run through all of those. Locked on SEC starts right now. Locked On SEC, your daily podcast on the Southeastern Conference. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And what's happening, everybody? Welcome into Locked On SEC. Great to have you guys along. Today's show is brought to you by Omaha Steaks. The holidays right around the corner. Finding the perfect gift is tricky. Omaha Steaks. Makes it easy to send friends and family an unforgettable gift guaranteed to be loved. Go to omahasteaks.com and enter college into the search bar to find the perfect gift package. I'm Chris Gordy. Thank you guys for making Locked on SEC your first listen every day. Remember, Locked on SEC is free and available on all platforms, including YouTube. Let's jump into it. Let's go around the conference. Boots out to the right. Makes the handoff. Throws the ball. What a catch. Around the conference. And we start over in College Station as Texas A&M defensive lineman DeMarvin Leal announced yesterday he is officially declaring for the upcoming NFL draft. He finished the year with the Aggies, finishing with 58 tackles, eight and a, eight and a half sacks, 12 and a half tackles for a loss through 11 starts. He is currently projected as a first round pick. Shows some true versatility, played snaps at defensive tackle, defensive end, and outside linebacker this past season. Mike Elko moving him all around. So congrats to DeMarvin Leal. Probably not playing in the bowl game since he bid farewell to uh, the College Station and the Aggies. But uh, congrats to him. He will be going very high in the 2022 NFL Draft. You know, over in Knoxville, the Tennessee Vols, they are headed to a bowl game in the coming weeks. But they will be playing, however, without one of their top DBs. Senior cornerback Alante Taylor announced yesterday he will not participate in the team's bowl game. He will instead focus on his professional prospects. He's already been invited to compete in the 2022 Senior Bowl. And he will also declare for the 2022 NFL Draft. So congrats to him and best of luck to him in the Senior Bowl. Over at LSU, new head coach Brian Kelly was introduced to the media yesterday. And... Among the things he discussed, he talked about the appeal to come down and coach in the SEC, which he called the best conference of college football. Kelly said, look, I came down here because I wanted to be with the best. He said, You're looked at in terms of champions down here, and I want that. I want to be under the bright lights. I want to be on the Broadway stage. He went on to say the SEC is obviously an ability to continuously turn out great football teams based upon a commitment from the school, great recruiting, great coaches, and playing at the highest level. Now, some news in terms of his staffing. According to the Athletics' Bruce Feldman, Kelly is going to retain the program's director of performance innovation in Jack Marucci, who's been there for 25 years. As far as his offensive and defensive coordinator goes, well, Ross Dellinger of Sports Illustrated reporting last night that Kelly's offensive coordinator at Notre Dame, Tommy Reese, turned down the opportunity to follow him to LSU. He will stay at Notre Dame and to top that off, Defensive coordinator Marcus Freeman had a discussion about him maybe coming to LSU. He was named the head coach at Notre Dame last night, replacing Kelly. So, Brian Kelly going to need to hire a new OC and DC at LSU as neither will follow him from the Irish. Several semifinalists have been announced for the Lot Impact Trophy going to the nation's top defensive player, and several SEC players find themselves on the list. N'Kobe Dean, Georgia linebacker, Georgia nose tackle, Jordan Davis, LSU linebacker, Damone Clark, and Kentucky safety, Yusuf Corker, all making the semifinalist list. So congrats to those guys. We'll see who ends up getting it, but can't go wrong with any of those guys. All great years in the SEC this year. Earlier this week, Ole Miss quarterback Matt Corral, he was awarded the Connerly Trophy going to the best player in the state of Mississippi. The Connerly Trophy has now been awarded to an Ole Miss player 10 times, the most by any school. One guy that's hoping to call the SEC home very soon, Arch Manning, 
top quarterback recruit next year. He has visited several schools around the SEC. And now that we're into December, well, those recruiters, recruiters could come see him at his school. Since his school, Isidore Newman, is out of the playoffs in New Orleans, recruiters are free to visit him. Manning is rated the number one player in the class of 2023. He had already uh, visited Alabama, Georgia, Clemson, Texas, and Ole Miss this fall. Ole Miss and LSU are going to be having to visit him today. Texas is scheduled to be there on Thursday, according to On3 Sports. Texas head coach Steve Sarkeesian is going to make that trip to go visit Arch Manning. Tulane's offense coordinator Chip Long is also expected to visit the campus. Georgia and Alabama very much on Manning's list, according to Chad Simmons of On3 Sports. Clemson looks to be down the list some, based on what one source told Simmons. So Georgia, Alabama, Ole Miss, LSU, all very much in the mix for Arch Manning. In transfer portal news, Ole Miss is going to lose a tight end to the portal as tight end Demarcus Thomas announced on Twitter he is leaving Oxford and will explore his options. As a freshman in 2020, he appeared in six games, mostly on special teams. He did not record any stats in those games. This year, he had one catch for six yards in the Rebels' win over Austin P. Meanwhile, Kentucky, they lost running back Travis Tisdale to the NCAA transfer portal on Tuesday. A handful of other Kentucky players also entered the portal on Tuesday night. Another Kentucky running back added his name to the list. Torrance Davis announced on Instagram he is going to explore his options. Davis played in six games at linebacker in 2020. Didn't record any stats this year. He transitioned to running back and did not see the field. So there you have it. That is around the conference. When we come back, we're going to talk all things SEC with our buddy Lynn Scarborough. We'll get his thoughts on Georgia and Alabama in the SEC title game. That is coming your way next. Look, the holidays are right around the corner. Finding the perfect gift is tricky. Omaha Steaks makes it easy to send friends and family an unforgettable gift to be loved. If you go to omahasteaks.com and enter college into the search bar to order the perfect gift package for $99.99, that's one penny less than $100, you will get 24 entrees like the world-famous bacon-wrapped filet mignons, chicken breast, sides, desserts, and so much more when you use the word college You'll also get an additional eight Omaha Steak Burgers free with your order. We've all heard the reports about shortages and shipping delays, so you do not want to wait. Order the perfect gift package today at omahasteaks.com. You'll get eight free burgers when you use our code COLLEGE. Achieve gifting greatness with Omaha Steaks. Incredible flavor, incredible value, and 100% guaranteed. omahasteaks.com, keyword COLLEGE. Run along here, Locked On SEC, and one of our favorite segments every week is catching up with our buddy Lynn Scarborough of Lindy Sports. Been doing it a long time, and uh, let's get him in here. Lynn, uh, welcome in, man. The uh, regular season coming to an end. We get championship weekend this week. What do you make, uh, I guess, of the year overall that the, the SEC had this year? 13 out of the 14 teams in the SEC are qualified for bowls. Now, that's never happened. Only Vanderbilt is not qualified to go. So we'll have 13 teams there. That that means, that, well, one thing it means there are a whole lot of mediocre teams in the SEC because you got five or six of them that are six and six because uh, they, they knocked each other off uh, with the exception of Alabama, Georgia, and Mississippi. Uh, all the others just, you know, are either seven and five, six and six, or five and seven or something like that. But a good thing on that, I'm, I'm – I've been on the committee for the Birmingham Bowl since we started that bowl with ESPN 15 years ago. I'm in charge of the publications and, and that type of stuff. And, you know, there's been several times that we did not have an SEC team uh, because there weren't enough that had qualified. And uh, we had to, had to go into other conferences. And then if you remember last year, because of COVID, a lot of bowls, uh, you know, didn't, didn't exist. And you had several teams that qualified and their bowl wasn't able to be held because of COVID. So this is going to be a really good year for the, quote, minor bowls because they're going to be able to have brand-name teams in a lot of cases where they haven't, and they're going to be able to have games because the, the disease, I understand we've got a new virus strain and this kind of thing, 
But for the most part, I've, I've been in a lot of stadiums this fall, and I've, I've been with tens of thousands of people that weren't wearing masks. And uh, if there's been any bad problems, I don't know about it. I suspect that we're not going to uh, do away with, uh, with college football like we did last year in the bowl season, which is a really good thing for the minor, school, the minor bowls, for the colleges, and for the fans. Lynn, I, I was reading a story over the weekend that was gushing over one Lynn Scarborough who has seen over, what, 500 games at Auburn? And, look, the Iron Bowl, we know it's a great rivalry, but, man, did Auburn blow that game and kept Alabama's playoff hopes alive over the weekend. Absolutely. Yeah, and I appreciate you mentioning that. I, David Housel wrote that, and, uh, I mean, y'all know who he is, and, and, and I didn't know David was going to do that. I would have I would have told him not to do it. But, uh, but yeah, that was – that was. Uh, that when Auburn played South Carolina uh, week four last, that was the 500th consecutive Auburn game that I covered. Um, that I did not go to the Auburn Nebraska game in Lincoln in 1981, and that's the last Auburn game that I did not attend. And this this Auburn Alabama game was was the 59th consecutive. Uh, Auburn Alabama game that I've that I've attended. I've actually attended more than that, but I did not go to the game in 1962. And I I think I don't really remember why we didn't go, but I think we didn't have tickets, even though tickets didn't cost like five dollars back then, believe it or not. But uh, but I did not go to the game in 1962. Yeah, the game the game on uh, on Saturday, you know, it's just so many uh, ifs on the thing on both sides. You know, if um, if Tank Bigsby turns to the right instead of t- turns to the left. Uh, he, he is tackled inbounds, not out of bounds. Another 35 seconds runs off the clock. Alabama doesn't have time to score and Auburn wins the game. Um, if Alabama, uh, if, if they on a, on a field goal attempt by Will Reichert, uh, who is, uh, you know, we're, we're friends of his family, going to church with his family. He's a great guy. Uh, he's a sure thing. And it's a bad snap and the snap is fumbled. So he doesn't get to kick it or, or they'd had three more points at the end of the ball game. Um, you had a had a situation where Alabama was driving, and uh, and it made a first down down at like the Auburn twenty or something, and you had a fifteen yard penalty come against them to call it all the way back, move the ball to like to midfield, and then they didn't they didn't score. They had to punt. The on the on and I'm just reading off individual plays. On in fact, on the first play that Alabama had from the three yard line at the very end of the ball game, uh, in the end zone, he drops back to pass. Uh, this is an orange and blue glasses uh, coming on on this one, uh, Chris. You can look at the, the, the pictures that's out on. Um, there's a grotesque holding call, uh, or, or else uh, Bryce Young would have probably been sacked. But but it certainly was a, it was a grotesque holding call, and officials right on it, and he didn't call it. That would have been a safety. That would have been a safety in the end zone. Auburn would have been ahead twelve to three. Alabama would have never gotten the ball back. So both sides have got multiple things that could have that could have given them the game or given them a margin at the end. But when a game goes, you know, it's that nip and tuck, such a defensive battle, and then goes into four overtimes, uh, people get their money's worth that uh, they went to those ball games. Talking with our buddy Lynn Scarborough of Lindy Sports. And uh, Lynn, we got a big one this weekend. We got the SEC championship game. Of course, uh, you know, Georgia's in the playoff either way. But in your mind, who would have uh, the best chance to beat Georgia here as we, we head into the postseason? Probably Alabama because of, because of familiarity. The uh, I'm going to pick. I know we're probably going to pick games here in a minute. I'm going to take Alabama to uh, to beat Georgia just just because in this situation that usually happens. Uh, Georgia has had a way of blowing. If you remember, Georgia would have won a championship. That their guy trips over the the yard marker at uh, at the two yard line. He trips over the chalk. I mean, there's a pass to a Georgia guy and he's caught the ball and he's going to turn around and go in the end zone. And he literally trips and falls down at the two yard line. Alabama wins. The uh, you know that kind of thing happens to George. George. Uh, the, the other time they played Alabama, uh, their quarterback threw the ball, and the ball was batted down not by an Alabama guy. He threw the ball and hit one of his players in the back of the helmet. The ball bounces up in the air, and an Alabama lineman catches the ball and gives Alabama the ball on the 30, 35 yard line or something like that. And Alabama scores off of a batted ball off of the Georgia player's headgear. And you've had weird stuff happen like that. Uh, I think Alabama's going to win that ball game. They, um, they've got so much on the line because Georgia, if Alabama beats Georgia, Georgia's still in the Final Four. They're the only team that is. You've got five teams. You've got Alabama, Michigan, Oklahoma State, Notre Dame, and Cincinnati. Well, Notre Dame 
is in a good position and a bad uh, position. Notre Dame cannot help itself by winning the ball game Saturday, where uh, you got the four others that can. On the other hand, they can't hurt themselves. So Notre Dame's going to have one loss regardless. If Alabama loses to Georgia, they got two. If uh, Iowa beats Michigan, they got two. If Baylor beats Oklahoma State, they got two. Um, if Cincinnati loses a game, uh, it's probably not going to matter because I really think this committee would give it to a two-loss uh, Michigan, Alabama, or Oklahoma State over a one-loss Cincinnati. I, I, that's just the reality of it. Even though Cincinnati beat Notre Dame, uh, I still think that, that Cincinnati's got to come through it undefeated. I kind of lean toward Houston winning that ball game. I think Houston's got the team that can win it, and Houston has no pressure because they've had a really, really good season. They're going to go to a good bowl game. The, the Cincinnati, they've got the, they're representing all group of five teams. They're representing all independents. They're representing every team that ever thought it got screwed out of the, out of being in the playoff. Cincinnati's got all that on them because they can be the first guy that had a good enough season, uh, that, uh, that they're going to make it and represent all those people that have thought they have not been treated fairly uh, over the years. And with that kind of pressure on, uh, I know they're on their home field, but I just kind of lean toward thinking that, that Houston's got a team that can knock them off. Lynn, before we uh, let you go, just a uh, quick thought. Um, the two new coaches coming to the SEC, Billy Napier leaving ULL for Florida, and, uh, of course, Brian Kelly leaving uh, Notre Dame for, for LSU. You have a quick thought on, on either of those guys. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think both of them are, are, you know, it's good to the SEC to have them. I, I'll tell you, Chris, uh, I, I know money speaks mighty loud, but, you know, when you're already making seven figures, I I wonder – if they realize what they're, what they're getting into, um, you know, LSU right now, I know that's your school, uh, Florida, uh, kind of the same way. They're walking into kind of a mess right now, politically, uh, you know, on the field, uh, NCAA, uh, doing investigations. And I just wonder if it was a, if it's a smart thing to do, obviously I love the programs. It's SEC and I'm a SEC guy, uh, and, and have a lot of connection, uh, you know, you know how much we've got stations in uh, in Louisiana and 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 stuff that I do for Tiger Rag, but I'm just I'm just wondering, it, it, are they going to are they going to be glad that they went to Florida and went to uh, went to uh, Baton Rouge, um, you know, kind of right off the bat here. But I, I wish them well. I think it's a good hire for the SEC. I think on paper it's a good hire for the schools. Um, it's going to be interesting to see who uh, takes the place. Same with same with Oklahoma. With uh, Lincoln Riley going to Southern Cal, you you've had a you know Chris, you've had so many coaching changes this year, and then so many significant schools that have changed. And I, I think it's uh, being you know the two the two uh, D one schools out in the state of Washington, both both were out coaches at the same time. So it's been really unusual. But I'm looking forward to this weekend. It's at least going to be cut and dried as to what happens there. Uh, if if every one of those teams win, then it plays into the hands of my argument that this four-team playoff is ridiculous. Go ahead and expand it to eight so that uh, everybody that deserves to be in there has a chance. He is the great Lynn Scarborough. Uh, again, lindysports.com. You can read all his stuff and does a great job with all the uh, season preview magazines and everything else. Uh, Lynn, thanks for the time as always, man. All right, guys. Talk to you all soon. All right, there he is, Lynn Scarborough of Lindy's Sports. When we return, I'm going to jump through some of the bowl projections for the 13 bowl eligible SEC schools. We'll run through that coming up in just a second. Need to remind you guys as we head into bowl season, Bet Online, they have got you covered with more props, odds, and lines than ever before as we march to the playoffs. And Bet Online, of course, remains your number one spot for all sports action this season. Head on over to their new updated website. You can do so on your mobile device or desktop, computer, laptop, whatever. Sign up today. Receive your 50% welcome bonus, 5-0, when you use our promo code Locked On. That's L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N. Use that promo code to receive your bonus, 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Uh, we got SEC basketball getting into full swing. we got the NBA. We've got, of course, all the bowl games, the college football playoff, and Bet Online is the fastest and easiest way for you to bet on all your favorite sports. Bet Online is where the game starts. Go 
Rolling along here, Locked On SEC. Thank you guys for making us your first listen every day. I figured we would jump right into it as uh, uh, with some bowl projections because we got 13 SEC teams that are bowl eligible. On bowlseason.com's Kevin McNamara, he has released his final bowl season projections prior to bowl selection Sunday, which is happening this weekend. So I figured we'd take a look at it. Over the last five weeks, Kevin has built out a logical look at all the bowl games, determining the probable respective matchups for that moment in time, a snapshot of bowl season right now. So let's take a look at it. Starting in just a couple of weeks, we will have, uh, he's projecting, it would be the U, Miami versus Florida in the Gasparilla Bowl. That would be an interesting one because Miami or uh, Florida just beat Florida State. And then we get to play the other team in the state of Florida in the U. That's an interesting one. On Christmas Day, they have the Camellia Bowl projected as North Texas versus Missouri. I think Missouri would win that one if that uh, pretty handily if that happened. On December 28th, the Birmingham Bowl, they're projecting Air Force versus South Carolina. Good opportunity there for Shane Beamer and his club to win a bowl game. Also on the 28th, the Liberty Bowl, they're projecting West Virginia versus Mississippi State. That would be a lot of fun. See Mike Leach's offense, Will Rogers, put up a bunch of yardage on West Virginia. On December 30th, they're projecting the Dukes Mayo Bowl, NC State versus Tennessee. That would be a nice one. NC State's have a, had a great year in the ACC. Josh Heupel's crew obviously overachieving. The only thing I was thinking about with Elante Taylor opting out, there's a cookie place in Knoxville. I was giving out two free cookies every time Elante Taylor had an interception. Well, he's opted out, going to the Senior Bowl, get ready for the draft. He won't be playing in that one, so no more free cookies. On, uh, on December 30th as well, the Music City Bowl, they're projecting Penn State versus Arkansas. That's a really good one. James Franklin just getting his big fat extension, 10-year contract, taking on Sam Pittman, who's coming off a fantastic 8-4 and four season. On New Year's, they're projecting in the Cotton Bowl, Michigan versus Alabama. So they've got that one in. So they've got Alabama in. The other one, the Capital One Orange Bowl, they've got Cincinnati versus Georgia. So those are two college football playoff games. So in this scenario, they must have Alabama beating Georgia in the SEC title game. Or maybe just something goes wonky where... Alabama finds themselves in with two losses, but either way, this projection has both Alabama and Georgia in the playoff. Also, New Year's Day, they are projecting the Outback Bowl to be Wisconsin versus Kentucky. Good matchup there. The Sugar Bowl, they're projecting Oklahoma State against Ole Miss. You know, Lane Kiffin would want to go toe-to-toe with Mike Gundy's offense, although Oklahoma State more defensive-minded this year than offense, as they typically are. Other games on New Year's Eve, the Gator Bowl, they have projected as North Carolina versus Auburn. Of course, SEC Network's Gene Chizik coached at both those schools. On New Year's Day, the Citrus Bowl, they are projecting Iowa versus Texas A&M. So the Aggies, man, what a... What a little bit of a fall there. They were hoping to get to a really good bowl game with a strong finish, but they lose to LSU last week, and and you fall all the way to the Citrus Bowl. And then on January 4th, the Texas Bowl in Houston, they're projecting Kansas State versus LSU. As we know, Ed Ogeron already gone. Brian Kelly hired. wonder if Brian Kelly would consider coaching the team at all in that ball game in his start in Baton Rouge. And there you have it again. That is from bowlseason.com. It's just their projections. None of that set in stone. But it is kind of fun to look at some of those potential matchups. Of course, uh, many of these will not be right, and they'll go with something else. But uh, figured we'd pass that along to you. Kind of a cool deal of uh, bowlseason.com doing some projections there on what we could see as far as SEC matchups go. That is just about going to do it for this edition of Locked On SEC. I'm Chris Gordy. Thank you guys so much for listening. We'll be back tomorrow as we really start to get into breaking down the SEC championship game. I'll give you reasons why Alabama has a chance and what they need to do against Georgia 
to be able to win this win this game. Look, everybody and their brothers jumping on Georgia because look, Georgia's been so good. They're giving up a touchdown a game. It's ridiculous. And Alabama's looked human for a lot of this year. Yeah, they eked out the Iron Bowl, but they didn't look good doing it. Yeah, they eked out the win over LSU, but they didn't look good doing it. A lot of times this year, Alabama's not looked great. I'll tell you exactly what they need to do tomorrow to get a win in the SEC championship game. Thank you guys so much for making Locked on SEC your first listen every day. Now go make your second listen. Go check out the Locked on Bets podcast with your boy Q and Lee Sterling, getting you all the picks you need on a nightly basis, getting you ready for all the game action. I'm Chris Gordy. We'll talk to you guys tomorrow right here on Locked on SEC.